Hello, and welcome back to the Real Estate of Mind Show. We're your host, Glenn and Amber. Hey, everybody. Hey, so uh, we help everyday people create wealth through real estate investing. We've got another great show lined up for you today, so let's jump right in. Yeah, so today we're going to talk about how to develop a real estate of mind. And we definitely did not start off that way. <laughs> no. uh, you know, there, there were a lot of bumps along the, uh, along the road, but... Um, we started out with persistence and determination, but there's a lot more to it than that. And what we're going to go over today is really some topics that are going to help you shorten that learning curve, because the faster you can get that real estate of mind, the faster you'll be successful. I think people that I know now, people that meet me now, I didn't know you before, they assume that I was always confident. They assume that I, that I never have any self-doubt. And that's just not the case. I've been in business for myself since I was 19. Um, going back long before that, um, I have got three older brothers and we're a very tight knit family. We would do anything for each other. Uh, we would, you know, we live all across the country, but in a moment's notice, we'd be on a plane and this has happened. We've been together within hours. We're all together when we need to be. And so we always come together. Great family. Although growing up, it was not like that. Um, being the youngest of four boys is tough and they didn't, they don't mean to, well, they mean to physically beat you down, but they mentally beat you down as well. And, you know, telling you that you will never be better than them and you'll never achieve anything. And, you know, just cutting you down a lot. And it's it's typical boy banter, but, you know, we're the youngest of four and I'm the youngest by seven years. So quite a bit younger than these guys. They're really old farts now. So, uh, <laughs> just in case they're watching. So, um, but we, our, our, the way we talk to them is kind of ball busting a lot. Mm -hmm. So that can tend to really wear on you and, um, and beat down your psyche. So <clears throat> when I started in business for myself, you know, I was 19 and... Even then, my folks trying their best, you know, we, we grew up relatively poor, lower middle class and um, maybe higher poor class, if that's such a thing. But we had to, you know, my parents said, listen, go get a state job and go work at the, I was with my mom and dad saying, go to work at the toll booth in New York State. And I'm thinking, I do not want to suck fumes all day long. So I had to really figure out how I was going to get over those hurdles. And so, you know, those stayed with me for many years and they're still always, I think, Things that happen as a kid, they're always with you, right? Right. I mean, it never actually leaves. You have to find a way to manage those thoughts that, are, that have been put inside you. So what I did, probably sometime around 20, I bought my first real estate course. Then I bought uh, Tony Robbins' uh, Personal Power 2, if anyone remembers that, when that came out on TV and infomercial. And started to really learn about controlling my thoughts. That was my early days of doing that joined a network marketing company and I was, you know, around a bunch of people that were involved in self-improvement and bettering their lives and thinking differently and focusing on success and learning all the things that I spew out now. I spent years doing that and reading books and going to seminars and workshops, listening to speakers, choosing who I associate with and all those steps is what's really helped me to have a better real estate of mind and be able to overcome the self-limiting beliefs and the self-doubts that were put in me as I was a kid. Yep. So, you know, we all have what I call our own version of head trash that came from something that happened in your childhood, some experience that you had in life. You know, those are the things that formed us and give us what our psychology is today. And for me, mine wasn't really self-doubt as much as I was just clueless. And that's, I, what, that's how I got her. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> she wasn't paying attention. I, I was clueless as far as like what it took to be an entrepreneur. And, you know, I, I had always worked for my family's business. So for me, it was like kind of entrepreneurship 101. I just kind of had to learn all, all of that stuff. I was definitely more conservative than you were. Um, yeah, always been a risk taker. Uh, well, I was a risk taker, too. But, you know, everything in life is on a continuum. So I was on the more conservative side of the risk taking and he was like, all right, jump off a cliff without a parachute. Yeah. <laughs> we'll figure it out the way down. Right. So um, my threshold wasn't as high. You know, I always had a side hustle in addition to my job when I when I did work at a regular job. But um, I just wasn't as big of a risk taker as Glenn was. And I had more fear and I had to really get over the nerves of taking those calculated risks. But once I did, you know, then life started to change. But the more I pushed myself out of my comfort zone, um, the more my mindset changed. And that's what can happen for you too, because as you keep doing that over and over and over, then it becomes more and more comfortable. I think about the first three houses that we flipped. And during that time, we were both going through divorces from our spouses. Um, we were full of fear because when you do your first house, if you haven't done it yet, or you're gonna do it, or you're thinking about doing it, it can be fearful when you're taking on these big numbers and all these thoughts go through your head. And that was a crazy time for us. We were full of all kinds of weird emotions. I can remember, I remember literally putting the wood floor, we did all the work ourselves. So we were together. This didn't help us. We were, to, we were yeah. together all the time, 24 hours a day for 
several months. We were, we'd, you know, wake up, have breakfast, see each other, get in the car, drive, go to Home Depot, come back, you know, do work on the house, come back home, have the kids, have dinner. We never had a moment to ourselves. It, it wasn't good. No, it, we, uh, <laughs> it wasn't good. No, we definitely had our share of fights together. But I can remember put, putting the wood floor in the, con the one condo we yeah. that we were living in. I remember bawling because we're going through divorce. I remember just bawling while I was putting the wood in. Just a terrible time. But you want to blame each other and you, all this stuff goes on. So there's, all this, there's a lot of bad, bad head trash going on. Yeah, remember that Bon Jovi. I can remember, it's so funny how things can like take you back. But that Bon Jovi oh, song God, came I on, never say goodbye. And we're like, turn that effing song off right now. Yeah, I don't want to hear that. I don't want to hear that. During, during that time, our mindset was not great. We uh, we actually had hallway sex a lot, which is interesting. It'd be like, fuck you, fuck you. That was the sex we had. So it was wonderful. But as, that's, we're walking, as we're passing each other. Yeah, that was really what we had. So it was uh, that's how that works. So it was interesting, but very, very difficult, very challenging times for sure. Yeah, but another good example that we could think of, though, was when we went to that Anthony Robbins, the Business Mastery event. And that changed our mindset because what one of the biggest takeaways we got from that workshop was that we needed to be owners and not operators. And we were yeah. total operators in our business. We were. I mean, we're trying yeah. to be owners and doing the things that we thought it took to be owners. But, you know, when you have that shift in thinking, um, it can really change things. And um, I wasn't done with that one. Well, I just you put it. my notes. I want to see what you have <laughs> to say there. I wasn't done with it, though. So, <laughs> um, but so the thing after I was actually pregnant when we went to that event and when we came home shortly after, um, my water broke at 22 weeks. And for those of you that don't remember, a normal pregnancy is 40 weeks. So that was a big deal. So I was in the hospital for six weeks before my, our son was born 12 weeks early. So yeah. between my hospital stay and then he was in the hospital for 87 days, three months, we were out of commission for um, almost six months out of yeah. our business. Oh, but for sure. The good thing about that was that when we got back from that Anthony Robbins event, we started implementing systems because our mindset changed. We knew that in order to have any sort of freedom in our life and to get to where we wanted to be, we had to put that in place. And that saved us through that time, really. One of the tools that we really came up with, it was sort of organic that happened to us, was that going through this process when when Cruz, our little boy, was uh, <clears throat> still in, in uh, mama's belly, they didn't know if he's going to make it. They didn't know how early he was going to be born because his wa the water broke it so early, whatever yeah, it was. 22 weeks. And then every every few days they would come in and say, now, if he's born today, and they would list off all the problems that he was going to have and the survival rates and all these things that were so gut-wrenching, I can't even tell you, they were disgusting to hear. And I think about the third, and this is, this. I always remember there was like six doctors and some head nurse, yeah. all these different doctors from different fields. And they wanted to let you know all the things. And it's okay if you make a different decision. It's okay if you if you don't have him. And we're like, okay, that's not going to happen. We're going to go forward no matter what. We're a family, so whatever. But we 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 listen to this noise, and I understand they're doing their job. I have respect because they're trying to prepare you mentally for the worst. And so I would come in. I drive to the hospital. I can remember feeling great. I'd be like, ba ba, -ba music's playing, and I'm thinking, okay, my wife's in the hospital, but I'm going to stay positive because I knew that if I didn't stay positive, that's not going to help the rest of the family. And I also knew that worrying wouldn't do anything but make me feel like crap. And make, if I felt like shit and I wasn't doing good, well, that's gonna make everybody else around me probably not feel well either, right? Because I'm trying to be strong for the family. So we sat in that meeting. Now, it was I think it was the third time they sat us down. And we're halfway through and I'm feeling like this. And they, the more they talk, the more that my emotions start to sink. I'm thinking about, literally I'm thinking, they said it's gonna change for the rest of your life. They said, you know, it will affect the rest of your children because your child could be in a wheelchair the rest of his life. and you know, be, be, um, not whatever the words are. I didn't want to think about it, but they, you know, it could be a number of problems he could yeah. have had. Yeah. But they said it's going to affect the rest of your life and you may have to take care of your child forever. In other words, there's no ending to raising your child. You may have to be with him forever, you know, and raise him and you won't have a retirement. And as we're talk, imagine what that feels like. You're thinking, okay, I'm going to retire in 20 years. And then all of a sudden you hear that noise. And you're thinking, so I'll never stop having to push a wheelchair around, never stop going to doctor's appointments. I'll never just stop because my son won't be a normal son. And I said, right in the middle, I said, okay, I, I stop, 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 stop. I said, I am, I can't do this. Anymore. I said, I have a question for you, doc. The head guy said, all of this stuff you're projecting and talking about is a moot point until our son is born. Am I correct? He looked around and he said, yes, yes, it's all speculation. I said, then we can't do this anymore. I can't do this anymore. I said, we are not going to sit and listen to this and have, have you make us feel like this, have us, you know, put our emotions in the toilet every day because of your projections. I said, I don't want to do it. 
I said, because until our son is born, we'll deal with whatever we deal with at that time. Yeah, and we weren't like going through that blindly. Like we weren't saying, you know, we weren't in denial. We knew no. we knew there could be issues, but we had heard enough. We had heard what they were, and we just didn't want to keep those negative thoughts in our head. Well, until, every yeah. three days they had new right. they had a new list of problems that could possibly happen. At, yeah, at certain gestation, this yeah. is what's likely. This is what's statistical. They said, well, it's better today for this, but you're going to face this. So, long story short, Amber and I came up with a motto. And we use it to this day. It's been almost five years now. And we say, don't worry until you have to worry. And we'll know when to worry. And that's something that we kept going. So if you want to adopt that for yourself, write that down. Don't worry until you have to worry. And you'll know when to worry. And we, every time one of us was weak, thank God the other one was strong. Most, that whole time, one of us took the reins of being strong that day. And every time we go, but what if, what if, what if we say, whoa, 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 don't worry until we have to worry. And that technique, one of many techniques, it really helped us go from a, a weak, you know, self-limiting beliefs to having a strong mindset. And you can carry that over to anything in life. If you're a real estate investor, you have to look and say, don't worry until you have to worry. Because the truth is, worry doesn't do a damn thing for you, nothing. It just makes you feel worse about the situation, which will probably make you feel physically worse and you'll probably get sick. And then you'll be even more worse. Is that a way, more worse? Yeah, <laughs> worse, I don't, I don't think know. so. No. <laughs> Didn't say I was a uh, <laughs> grammologist. So anyways, so, so anyways. As you're talking though, I was thinking about something else too, as far as like being in the right state of mind. There were some other things that we did too. You worked out every day. I did, which with, you with said, a trainer, hired right, a trainer. Right, and that, that helped you stay more mentally focused and totally. you know, you were kind of able to get out some of those aggressions and get your adrenaline going and, and endorphins and all that stuff. Yeah. And I, Every single day in that hospital that I was in there for over six weeks, I got up, I got dressed with normal clothes, I put my makeup on. Even a lot of the doctors and nurses made comments to me about, nobody does that. Nobody gets dressed every day because you're just in a hospital. But for me, that was important for my mm -hmm. mind so that I didn't feel like I was sick. And then another thing that we did was we weren't going to find out the sex of the baby. Um, we were going to be surprised when he was born. But when all of that happened, we wanted to know who to root for. We wanted to give this child a name. We wanted to yeah. to really, you know, I know what you're get this invested. Great. Yeah. <laughs> and what, <clears throat> are you going to talk about Cullings? Yeah. Was that your about? Then you go ahead. Well, you can. All right. So I'll tell you. So Amber approached me. I didn't mean to interrupt you. I just I hadn't thought about that. You didn't have any notes. So I think it's good that we're going off, off notes. Um, Amber said, you know, we, we, this is going to be a boy. We're like, okay, we have to give this kid a name. It's got to be a gladiator name, Thor. Well, we already um, we already had Cruz. We already had Cruz picked out if it was a boy, but we needed a middle name for him. And that's not, what I you know, there were, I guess I was wrong. There then. were not a lot of things that went well with right. Cruz. That's true. That's true. So we, we we had said that. We had said, you know, I love the movie Gladiator. I said, how about Maximus? I want a powerful person that can fight through. We just want to give him a, a fighter middle name. We looked at like Knights of the Round Table, and I mean, we looked at all sorts of names. Superhero names, everything. And Amber said, you know... I love your mom, and you love your mom. But she is the most stubborn, <laughs> pig-headed woman in the world. Sorry, mom, if you're watching, but I love you to death. Bull-headed, tenacious, you are, you are feisty. so strong and stubborn. She's 82, and she refuses to let us do anything for her. She still snowblows her driveway and go, whatever. She, you, she's 82, you think she was 52, and she'll let you know it every time you talk to her. <laughs> she'd still wrestle you to the ground if she could. She oh, probably she would. would, yeah. So she raised four boys, four of us, right? So Four tough. type A's. So her maiden name was Cullings. That's what all my cousins' names are. Uh, last name is Cullings. And um, she said, uh, Amber said, how about Cullings? And I said, that is perfect. Like we both looked at each other and said, that's the name. So now his name is Cruz Cullings Schwarm. So we named him that name. And that was a mindset piece for us right. to say he's going to be a fighter. Now he didn't know his name, but I know that I, I, you know, I know this might sound weird. I believe in the energy that comes off of us. I believe if we were looking over, looking over him every day and saying, oh, oh, I don't know, I don't know. I believe that's not good energy. I believe that we communicate at a different level. I think people sense it, even babies. And I think that he sensed every day we're saying, nah, you're a fighter, man. You're going to do this. You're going to make it happen. So. Yeah, and then the day he was born, they actually came in after working on him for about three hours and said, doesn't look good. Actually, the doctor told Glenn it looks grim. I was yeah. really in and out of it. I was pretty drunked don't. up. Don't, stuff, yeah, but. don't kind of make it through the night. That was a tough night. That's um, what, just some, over, some thoughts to overcome that night. Whew. So at, Glenn actually went up to the NICU. I was not able to actually even get out of bed at that moment. But Glenn went up to the NICU and gave him like a swarm pep talk. Yeah. And told him he needed to be a fighter. And yeah, said, we're fighters, man. You got to do this. I said, no problem. So. The next day we knocked in and, or we walked in and the nurse said, he's a beast. Like he had started fighting. So yeah. it was a 
was awesome. So lo- lots so, of lots of ways we've had to overcome. We share a lot of the personal stories. So we, you know, lots of ways we have to overcome that head trash. And that's you're going to have head trash in business and in life, and you've got to learn to overcome. If you want to have the best life you can possibly have, you want to be wealthy, not just not just financially, but emotionally and spiritually and all that. Have peace and happiness. You have to learn how to battle that head trash. That's what we're trying to talk to you about today. Yeah, you can either let it cripple you or you can let it like propel you forward and conquer it. Totally. You know, so here are some tips. Um, Tips on how to have a real estate of mind for success. The first one is consistently monitor your thoughts. Now, what does that mean? That means listen to those records that play in your head. Are the, are the stories telling yourself, are the stories that you're telling yourself true? And, you know, a lot of times... Um, were they your stories or were someone else from there when you were a kid? Right. Like my brothers, love your brothers, but that's, you know, constantly tell you that you're not going to amount to much and you're always going to be small and you're always weak. And you'll never win, never win, never win. That gets in your head after a while. And that's when you're young, you're really impressionable and that stays with you. So you have to learn who put that crap in there. Right. I got to get it out of there. Who put it in there in the first place? But it doesn't matter who put it there. The, it's already there. It doesn't matter who it is. Don't get mad. Don't blame. It's over. Get past it yourself. But, and most of the time, those stories are there to protect yourself from perceived danger. But you have to ask yourself that question. Is it really true? Or is it just a story I'm telling myself to protect myself? Yeah. So most of these self beliefs are subconscious. You don't even know they're there. That, that's like Amber said. They're happening behind the scenes. So it's really important to start to see. And it'll take you some time. And you'll see it once and go, I don't know, is that, is that a self limiting belief? And then one time you'll hear it again and go, you son of a gun. And you'll start to catch a rhythm and then you'll start to see what's triggering it. You know, what triggers that thought? And once you know that trigger, that's a loud car just went by <laughs> during our filming here. So um, it's it's important that you know though. So I made some notes of some I, some things that might be, um, you know, some top self limiting beliefs that this may resonate with you. Quit beeping the horn, we hear you. <laughs> All right, I'm not, I don't know if you can hear that on the, on the uh, recording or not, but Somebody's here we go. Somebody's not very happy outside. So um, you might, might say, I'm not good enough or smart enough. I'm too old. It takes money to make money. I'm afraid of failing. I've already tried everything. This is probably just another scam. I don't deserve success. I don't have the discipline to do it. There's too much competition. So these kind of self-limiting beliefs are the ones that hold you back. If you catch yourself saying things like this to yourself all the time, or ah, that's you know, get mad at rich people. I, we had a girl that worked for us one time that used to get so mad at people that were wealthy. And the better that we started to do with our business, our very first assistant, the better we did, the more bitter she got towards us for no apparent reason. Yeah. And what I realized was that she just couldn't be around people that were more successful than her because it did something to her psyche instead of being happy for them. So one of the favorite things that I've learned on our journey is that feelings are neither right or wrong. They're not, but thoughts, thoughts can be, thoughts can be challenged. So if you do have one of those self-limiting beliefs that pops up, question it, challenge it, ask yourself, is it true? Because most of the time it's not true and then you can move past it. Our daughter is seven years old and one of the things that I love to do um, when she's getting herself worked up is I, I ask her, what are you telling your brain right now? What story are you telling your brain to make you get so worked up, to make you get so upset and, and start crying? And is it the truth? And sometimes she can answer me and sometimes she can't. So then I'll ask her, okay, what is a solution that you can, you know, what is something that you can tell your brain so that that changes how you're thinking? Because our our thoughts create our feelings, not the other way around. And sometimes she, you know, she's seven. So sometimes she struggles with with knowing what to come up with. So I might assist her. I used to challenge it. Like when she started that, I thought to myself. She's too young. I thought, you're crazy lady. I mean, I'm like Amber, you know. Mm-hmm. You're kind of out there with that. She's only four years old, or wh- whenever you started that. Yeah. But son of a gun, I tell you, she she does. She can't always control it because she's seven. Hell, right. I'm 51. I can't always control <laughs> right. it. I try my best, but I can't control it all the time. But I'm watching her, and I thought to myself, boy, if if you hadn't taught her that, that's a skill I wish I had learned as a oh. young child. So, oh, yeah, totally. Yeah. So it, it it is life changing. That yeah. skill is. But if she's not sure of what to come up with as a coping statement or a solution, then I can help her. But then next time I ask her that question, she has that in her in her pocket. It's in her in, internal tool belt that she can use. And then we also have a four-year-old. So we teach our kids. I mean, I wish I knew this when our older two were younger, too. Yeah. But we, we've learned it along the way. Yeah. I tell them that your brain is like a computer. And you're the keyboard. You get to type. You get to 
type in what you want your brain to think. So, you know, I try to put it in terms that they can understand. You know, they're used to their iPads, they're used to typing it in or even, you know, saying, hey, Siri, look this up for me on YouTube Kids or whatever. So by doing that, it makes it relatable and and they, they're totally grabbing that and using it. And it it's, it's really, yeah. really rewarding to see them do that. Um, they're the boss of their brain, not the other way around. And I, I think it's pretty cool to see those wheels turning when they really start to to get that and apply it. And when I see them do that, it like totally makes my day. Yeah, when they're angry, when you see Chess get angry, and then she she thinks if she if she gets too angry, she can't she can't control it like like all of us. But there's a point where she'll start to think, and you you think to yourself, oh my God, there's this is the loudest recording ever with all these cars right here today. So, um, but she'll you'll see her stop. You'll see her actually you see her brain going to work. I think to myself, that's good because you're learning a skill. It's the hardest <clears throat> thing to learn. It I think is, it's the yeah. hardest thing to learn is to learn how to control your thoughts, how to change your thoughts, how to change the path that you're on once an emotion gets a hold of you and starts to rip you down that hole that sucks the life out of you and ruins your day, ruins your week, ruins your month. You ever have those times? I know I have where you get sucked down that hole. It's the hardest thing to master to figure out how to make that change, how to control that thought and how to stop going down the path. But I'll tell you this, once you do, it's a huge step yeah. in developing your real estate of mind because once you control that, you can control the quality of your life in every area, every relationship, every business development, every business idea, every personal relationship, every business, every friendship. You get to control the situation. And I tell you, it feels empowering when you know you can control your emotions through anything. And to piggyback on that, you know, again, most people in our life live their life based on their feelings. But if you can switch that and live your life based on your thoughts, that, that changes. And a good analogy is, think about if you're riding in a car and a sad song comes on and it takes you back to this really dark time or this really emotional time in your life, um, whatever that is, you know, maybe your eyes like immediately well up with tears. So in that very moment, y you might start to feel sad and that's not right or wrong. That's, it's okay to feel sad, but it is a choice because right then and right there, you get to choose to stay in that feeling or not. Change that or station. you can choose to change the channel. Yeah. Which one do you do? Do you let yourself go through that whole entire song and fall your eyes out? Sometimes you want to. Let's be honest. Sometimes you hear a song, you're like, damn it, I'm moving for a cry. I need to get this out of my system. That's okay. But sometimes. But it's a choice. I, I have definitely heard a song rising my dad or something that's sad and, and losing it. And I'll, I'll be like, not ready for that now. Not doing that yeah. now. And I'll crank on some Prince or something I love to just go or Van Halen or some 80s rock or something that really gets me going, and I can literally, you can feel your body change. So you can change your environment, you get to change your environment that will change your outlook on the day, on the moment, and on your life. Yep, So absolutely. Um, this is important too, you need to adjust as necessary, right? So um, things will never go as planned, even though you have a great plan to get through whatever you're working on, or you have an idea how to do it, it's never gonna go smooth. Um, you're always gonna get knocked around, that's just the way it is, it's life. Take it all with stride. Just remember, tomorrow's a new day. 10 minutes from now is a new minute, new 10 minutes, new hours coming up. You can always start over again anytime you want to. That's the power of this process. When you st when you stumble, you fall, you drop the ball, you, you're, you don't control emotions like you want to, you blow up at your spouse. I've never done that, but I've heard that happens to people, you know, but I've, I've heard about it. But you know, if you do that, you can, you can start over again. Yes, if you're a man, you'll be in the hole for a long time and alone <laughs> at night. But anyways, that's the way might, it goes. You might be sleeping at the house you're renovating. <laughs> that's very true. That has happened. So, okay. But anyway, so just, but take it in stride. You can always start over again and uh, and rebuild from there because you will screw up. Yeah. And, you know, when you're flipping houses or you're renovating houses or whatever, things happen, things come up. When we first started flipping out, I would freak out when the contractor would call with a problem. You know, hey, there's termite damage or there's frozen pipes or whatever. I, you know, my mind would just like go crazy all of a sudden. Oh, my gosh, how much is that going to cost? And are we going to lose money on the house? And, you know, my my mind would go quickly down that rabbit hole and I think we we're going to fail. And, you know, that's not a fun place to be. But no. because of the experience that I've had and because I've trained my brain to process information differently, now it's just another day. I know that no matter what comes along, we're going to handle it. We'll figure it out. And that comes in time too. It's like a muscle. Once you build that skill, you'll get better and better and better at it. There was a great book I read um, called Unf Yourself, right? So it's, uh, let's unfuck yourself. I already cussed once in this one, so who cares? <laughs> so my mom's going to be, yelling, mouth. I'll be getting an email from my mother, I'm sure. Um, but, um, but the book on Fuck Yourself had a chapter on expectations. And it said that expectations is what creates our anxiety. So if you expect to be at 
um, a dinner party at six o'clock and you're running an hour late, that creates anxiety, right? It makes you like nervous. If you're running 10 minutes late, you're all panicked trying to get something done. But if you didn't have any expectations for that, well, you, maybe you wouldn't be so, if you just could show up whenever you wanted to show up, you wouldn't be stressed about it. But we have these limitations that we put ourselves. So our expectations, not meeting expectations can really create um, anxiety in our lives. So it's important that you know that you want to um, uh, accept everything. What's what, what's the saying go? Oh my I gosh, it's a great, it's a great thing in that book now. What does that say? No, oh, expect, expect, expect anything and accept everything. So expect, one, honey. expect anything. You make it fun of me? <laughs> a little bit. <laughs> I don't care for her today. Accept everything and uh, you know, I'm done. I'm done. Expect, expect, expect anything, anything and accept everything. Accept everything. So expect, if you if you just let out there, expect anything to happen to you and accept everything that happens to you. And when it happens to you, then make a decision of how you're going to handle it. So number Good, three. smart ass. Take over. <laughs> number three is create a new normal. This is where things start to really get fun because your life starts to change. You know, step one and two take a lot of practice. They take some <clears> self-discipline. They take really kind of looking at that um, part of yourself that's not so fun to look at. Um, things, you know, we, I, I just thought of an expression, you know, a lot of, a lot of times. You better get it right because I didn't get mine right. So I want to make sure. Well, I hear a lot of people say, you know, I'm this way or that way or whatever. And they make an excuse for part of their personality or how they were raised, but I turned out okay. Did you? <laughs> or, or is that side of yourself something that you could work on and something that you could grow? Um, you know, we have to get out of our comfort zone. But when you really start challenging those thoughts and challenging yourself, that's when you create your new normal and you get to feel and experience the rewards of those changes. Yeah. So wind up here. So um, what do you got there? Let's talk about our new normal. Like when we first started, you know, oh, it's, yeah. it has certainly evolved and changed. But I wanted to, to talk to you guys today about like when we first got started in real estate and first started to have success, what some of those earlier changes were. So I think I think for us, we, I mean, I see you have some notes here about hiring the lawn person. We wanted to have other, you know, we wanted to be able to hire other people. Is that what you're talking about? Yeah. So we wanted to be able to hire other people to do things so we could actually have more time, more right. valuable time with each other. So we, one of the things we did to help us with that stuff was to uh, hire people like a lawn person. We hired people to clean the house. So <clears throat> let me talk about cleaning the house for a minute, because when we first said, you know, he, he actually suggested it because I never would have suggested having somebody clean the house in a million years because I felt guilty about it. Like I felt like I should be superwoman. I should be able to handle it all. I, I should feel be really able... guilty too. <laughs> I should be able to, you know, be an awesome wife and an awesome business partner and the best mom and go to all those kids school things. Like I, I really thought I needed to be superwoman. So for me, I asked myself that question. Is it true? Are you not enough if you hire a cleaning person? Are you, are you lacking somewhere? And I answered no, that's totally fine. Because, and the, the thing about even that one issue was I was so wrong because hiring that one person to clean the house gave me more time to be a better mom, a better business partner, a better wife and all of those things. So I was telling myself this story that was completely false. So we, I, my brothers like to make fun of me for this one a lot. I hired a pooper scooper. There's a guy comes by, he passed a card out and said, you want me to clean up your dog crap every week for 12 bucks? I'm like, absolutely. That's a wonderful investment for me. So we have that. We have, um, we hired an assistant. As we grew, we hired a project manager. So all those things started to be our new normal, right? So we start with the thoughts as we worked our way through. Before you know it, we were able to have a new normal, have more success to hire more people so we could spend time doing the things we want to do in life. And, uh, you know, as your business grows, your new normal will also evolve and your life will change. You look back and say, gosh, I this stuff I used to do, I don't have to do it anymore because I've ma monitored my thoughts. I've been growing as a person. And as you grow, usually your business will grow with it and you'll have more choices and more things you can do. So this is so important if you want to change and if you want to grow. If you're happy where you're at and living the life that you want to live, you're not going to do any of this because it's hard work challenging your thoughts and, yeah. and making these changes. Um, but if you're sick and tired of being sick and tired and you want to make a change, you'll force yourself to go through these steps to make that that switch and have that real estate of mind. So let's go ahead and recap the three things we covered today. So number one, we talked about consistently monitoring your thoughts. Number two was adjust as necessary. And number three was to create a new normal. 
So we would love to hear from you. You know, what kind of self-limiting beliefs have you had? Um, were you able to overcome them? Or do you need help overcoming them? Do you need some sort of piece of advice or, or some tips? And whatever the case may be, please leave a comment below and either Glenn or I will personally comment back and help you through those. You definitely deserve a great life. No matter what anyone's told you, no matter what your thoughts were, you deserve a great life. And the way to get there is really to monitor your thoughts, to start there and start to change all the things we just talked about today. That's how you create a great life for yourself is by really, you know, we call it the real estate of mind show because we know that once you control this, you can control, that's the only thing you realize you can control in your life is your thoughts. It's the only thing we actually can control and at all. And it will affect not just your business life, but it will affect every area of your life. Every single area. So it's, uh, now that you know you have a lot of thoughts, monitor the thoughts, start to choose the good ones and start to build a new habit that you put the good ones in all the time. And that's what you focus on. And I think you'll see your life change, not think, I know from experience, you'll see your life change, your relationships change, your business change, and you'll create a new normal for yourself and look back and say, I can't believe I created this life. But it's because you start with a thought many years ago and you worked on it over and over and over again. So you have been listening to the Real Estate of Mind show. We are your hosts, Glenn and Amber Schwarm. If you found value in this podcast, please make sure you leave us a note below. Um, tag any of your friends that you think would enjoy it or benefit from it. And uh, we can find us on social media, Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, all of that good stuff under Glenn and Amber Schwarm. Remember, everyday people really do create wealth through real estate investing. The only real question is, will you be next? So this has been one of my favorite topics so far to talk about, and I'm excited to see you next week. See you soon.